Thank you very much. Um, I would just like to welcome all the participants um, and the attendees to MHPN's interdisciplinary panel discussion. Tonight the discussion is on collaborative care and mental health of people from migrant backgrounds. We are very fortunate tonight to have four excellent speakers on the panel. We have uh, firstly Dr. Joanne Gardner. Joanne's a GP with a special interest in refugee mental health. She works as an adult refugee health fellow at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and also at CoHealth. Joanne, may I just ask you, how did your interest in refugee mental health first come about? Uh, thanks, Michael. I was lucky enough to see an asylum seeker in about 1995 and I foolishly rang up his solicitor and asked if I could help and whereupon I started seeing many asylum seekers and my interest sprang from there. Right, so the word spread. Well done. And joining Joanne is uh, Harry Minus. Uh, Harry is a well-known psychiatrist from Melbourne. It's great to have you with us, Harry. Hi, Michael. You're involved in a range of projects and organizations. Uh, some of that involves international work and also work here at home. Uh, can you tell us a bit about this international work? We uh, are involved in, in projects that are focused on developing mental health services uh, in, in a number of countries in Asia. Um, our biggest projects are in Vietnam, Indonesia and Sri Lanka, but we also work with some regional organisations like ASEAN and WHO and so on. So most of our work there is working with colleagues in university departments or in service agencies and with ministries of health and social affairs. So you have a special interest in systems and mental health? Yeah, very much so. Where our our interest is um, precisely that: how how can we actually build systems that actually work better for people who have a variety of needs? Great, Harry. Thank you very much for joining us. We also have Lata Satyan. Lata, thank you for joining us. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your work in the area of family violence and? Um, uh, and strategies to prevent this, uh, particularly in relation to um, migrants and the Indian community uh, in your work as a psychologist and a, and a teacher. Sure, I'll be happy to, Michael. Hello, everyone. A pleasure to be here this evening. Um, well, I have been a psychologist for quite a number of years, and through that I started seeing uh, several women who approached me um, on their own, really, to just talk to me. You know, they did not come and see me as a professional as such, but they wanted to speak to somebody who was an Indian and uh, who perhaps understood the cultural background and who could help them in any way. And so my work started that way. Uh, but since then, so I do work as a voluntary psychologist within the Indian community, uh, but also I conduct research in the area of family violence across migrants as well as non-migrants. So uh, I'm involved in a range of um, um, incidents, if you like, um, on a regular basis. And at any given time, I'm assisting at least four women concurrently. So oh, well done, Lada. Thank you. Yes. That's good. So your expertise extends all the way from Deakin University in Victoria to Facebook and the World Wide Web. <laughs> well, a bit of that, I would just say. I think a few people have contacted me through different means, um, which I'll go through it through my presentation as to how women actually contact me. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lata. I'm going to carry on um, from where I stopped. But briefly, I've int introduced Joanne Gardner, a GP from Melbourne with a special interest in migrant health. Uh, Harry Minus, a psychiatrist um, from Melbourne with a special interest in systems in mental health and also with assisting um, third world countries in delivering better mental health through better systems. Um, we also introduced Lata Satyan, a psychologist who teaches at Deakin University in Victoria and who has a, um, a number of, of clients she follows uh, from the migrant uh, Indian community with, uh, with problems. Um, the last person I'm going to introduce in our panel tonight is, is Vivian Braddock. Um, Vivian is, is a social worker um, by training um, and um, she is presently um, the um, 
is presently um, working with the Queensland Transcultural Mental Health Centre. Uh, she leads a statewide uh, consultation team to help improve the mental health care of, um, of migrant clients. Uh, Vivian, what do you find are some of the biggest challenges you find in improving the mental health care of, of clients uh, with other languages apart from English? Yes, I think some of the biggest issues that we certainly see are uh, around stigma, that there can be a lot of shame and stigma in having a mental illness, but also too, I think really importantly, about how mental health services are responding to clients from migrant and refugee backgrounds. I think there are a lot that we have to learn and that we can certainly improve. Thanks very much, Vivian. That was very good. You may need to just speak up a little bit uh, or turn your volume up a little bit. Thanks, Vivian. Okay. Now, I'll just go through a few grand rules um, for tonight. Um, of course, we all uh, need to be respectful to each other, uh, participants and panelists, and behave as if it were a face-to-face -face act activity. Um, the... Um, Attendees can post comments and questions for panelists in the general chat box. Um, and the feedback from the, uh, from the uh, attendees is important and finishing the short exit survey. Now, the learning uh, objectives and outcomes for today are threefold. Um, Firstly, to raise awareness of the migrant experience and associated mental health risks, particularly for women with young families. And, and really that uh, pertains to the case study. Um, and the case study gives us lots of information that will help us in achieving this learning outcome. Secondly, we need to identify the key principles of the featured disciplines approach in screening, diagnosing, and supporting the mental health of people from migrant backgrounds. And this is achieved um, through the presentations from our excellent panel. And then thirdly, in our um, interdisciplinary collaborative discussions afterwards, question and answer with the panel, um, we will then explore tips and strategies for interdisciplinary collaboration among practitioners working with migrants experiencing mental health issues. Now, without further ado, we will move on to the GP perspective. And um, Joanne, I would just like you to start, please. Thanks very much, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Um, I suppose at this point, um, here I am with Rashika, Cuddling Anisha, and Ishan sitting in front of me. And um, by this stage, hopefully, I have had some alarm bells starting to ring. And I'm thinking that this one isn't going to be straightforward. And I'd better think pretty carefully and tune in to the zen of the moment to try to work out what to do next. And clearly, Rashika's posture, she looks very worried, very intent. And Ishan, his attitude doesn't quite gel. He seems to be a little bit more worried about his passing his exams than his, uh, his baby. And the crying is obviously annoying him a little bit. So I'm thinking, how shall I engage this pair and do my best? So the first thing I would think is, um, praise them for attending, bringing the baby so promptly. I would try to perhaps normalise the idea that being a young couple with a little baby on, on their own without family support is very difficult. And I would probably talk about, say that I have met many couples in a similar situation and I admire them very much, think they're very brave and um, that our practice, our surgery is always keen to help them in however, whatever way we can. Um, I would perhaps ask Rashika a little bit about how she's going, her physical health, something fairly neutral. And I would ask Ishan a little bit about how he's going as well to try to engage them both. Um, then I would try to do a very thorough examination of the baby for reassurance, um, starting at the top of the head, working all the way down, doing every bit, making sure that they knew, and particularly Rashika, that I was... Uh, doing everything I could to make sure that the baby was okay and to particularly engage her and make her see that I was a trustworthy person by the means of the way I was managing her baby at least. And um, then if possible, 
one side sorted out why um, the little one has a fever, I would try to see Rashika on her own. Now, this isn't always easy, particularly as Ishan isn't happy that I would do that. But quite often, if I talk about, first of all, bringing the baby back in a few days for a checkup of the fever, you know, whatever it is that I might find a check of the chest or feeding or what have you, the sick baby is a really good in to this family, this couple, gives you a really good uh, way to engage them. The second thing is I would say to Ishan and Rashika that, uh, you know, women after childbirth do need regular checkups to make sure they're okay. And often this is women's business and uh, it's important that um, that uh, Rashika has the opportunity to have a, a full women's checkup. It's quite possible that she she may, I can't remember, she may or may not have had a six-week check. She may or may not have had a pap smear. So at least I can offer that she does that. And most men in that situation are quite happy to go out of the room at that point, at least in my experience. If, of course, I was a male doctor, it would be a little bit more difficult and I would try then to refer to a female doctor or a women's health nurse if I was lucky enough to have one in my practice. Uh, a quick point about language. Now, this couple speaks very good English, but um, it is very, very important when you are seeing people from non-English speaking background that you offer a trained interpreter. The telephone interpreting service is a free service that any GP can use to register. Um, the interpreter can be on site or over the phone and um, the interpreter can also be interstate and in certain circumstances, I have actually arranged with the patient before using the interpreter that I would give the patient an alias and use an interpreter interstate so there was no way that anyone could work out who they were and this has been very successful. Um, now when we look at this family there are a few things obviously that uh, come to mind and we are going to talk about. One is the possibility of intimate partner violence and how we deal with that in this complicated setting. Another is uh, little Anisha's sleeping problems and possible failure to thrive. And that again is a, a way of, of uh, involving other services perhaps in a fairly safe and non-judgmental way. The third point is Rashika's social isolation and her need for support and how we go about facilitating that. And then I think it isn't, mustn't be forgotten that Ishan is clearly under quite a bit of stress and um, as a way perhaps of supporting this couple, his issues also need to be at least considered. Um, so what can a GP do when they're faced with this sort of situation when we're querying intimate partner violence? I suppose if I've been lucky enough to get to the point where now I have Rashika on her own, she might have seen me a few times. Maybe Ishan is now comfortable enough to allow her to come because he realises that we're a trustworthy practice, we're helping his daughter. Um, if uh, things have improved, he will be studying and working more effectively. What I would do with Rashika is I would first of all try to facilitate the discussion. Um, the RSCGP has some very good guidelines on managing violence in general practice. They talk about, for example, having posters in the waiting room so that um, the practices revealed to be a, a fairly a, a safe practice, a practice that considers these things. And I would try to allow discussion. I'd ask the question. And often I ask these sorts of difficult questions in the third person. For example, um, something along the lines of, uh, I know that uh, some people, some husbands and wives have difficulties at home. Is there anything worrying you at the moment that you'd like to speak to me about today? Uh, so I would try to put it in a fairly non-judgmental, fairly uh, open-ended way to really allow Rashika to respond at the level that she wanted to. And I would also be aware that she may not tell me anything or may only hint and then a couple of visits down the track she may be prepared to say a little bit more. Um, I think that the best approach would be a very non-judgmental and empathic sort of approach um, and that I would validate her experience, uh, whatever is going on, that her experience of if she is being abused, that that is not acceptable. Um, but at the same time, try not to push her too hard to make any particular step that she may not be willing to make. 
because she is very on her own. She has a little baby to care for and she's struggling hard enough as it is without getting pressure from me. What she needs from me is a supportive, kind uh, person to whom she can come and who can at least tell her what her options are and what is acceptable in Australia, give her a norm um, and that I can offer her information and resources in the appropriate language. At some point down the track, um, if things were really not very good, it would be possible to talk about a safety plan, but this would be way down the track possibly for someone in her situation. Um, and Joanna, I think it's I'm just going to have to ask you to, I'm just going to have to ask you to uh, to um to move along to the slide. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Thanks. I think it's also important that I be fairly very non-judgmental over any issues to do with culture or arranged marriage and perhaps at some point check in about her family of origin attitude to separation and divorce. Um and be aware that as she's on a visa this may pre also present certain difficulties. Um other supports that might I might be able to bring in at a fairly early level would be an enhanced home visiting maternal child health nurse support service to help her with um, Rashika and Anisha or to um, offer offer an uh, intimate partner violence support worker. And, uh, thank you very much. Thank that you. Was, that, was, that was excellent, Joanne. Um, just for the benefit of those who, who lack sound um, earlier on we, we're, and who may not have read the case, we're, we're dealing with a, a family, um, migrants from, uh, from India. Um, Rashika, um, uh, the mum, has presented uh, with her husband and with her little baby. The baby is possibly not, not thriving. Um, and there is a question as to whether Rashika, the mum, has got some bruising. Um, they're under m multiple stressors of, of difficulty in finding work, falling behind in study, uh, and having a, a, a young baby um, in a strange country. Uh, so, Harry, uh, just with that setting, I, I will just move on to your presentation, please. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, I think Joanne has identified all of the key issues. Uh, we should just go back a little bit. Now, this is a Hindu family. Uh, arranged marriage is not that uncommon. Um, Ishan is one of very many students who are from overseas in Australia and who are studying and at the same time are working. He is working as a taxi driver, mostly at night, so that he doesn't see his family so much. Um, Rashika, who worked as a, a in, in a business role in India, um, has made many applications but is unable to find work. So there may also be issues. She's not even getting uh, interviews, so there may be issues and concerns about whether there's racism at play, whether there is discrimination against somebody from India. They've only been in Australia for 12 months, so they're still really just settling in. Um, and it's clear that they have some significant financial problems. They're living in shared accommodation. It would be necessary to find out what that shared accommodation actually is. Who are they living with? Do they have any private space? Are they able to have private discussions? Are they able to look after their child um, in a way that uh, a young family would want to do? So as Joanne said, um, it's, a, it's a situation where uh, both Rashika and her husband are under considerable pressure. Uh, there, so there are concerns, I think, about every member of the family. If we go to the, 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 you know, the, the person who, who has, pre has been presented uh, with the problem is the baby. Uh, she's small for her age. It's a matter of working out. And as Joanne says, this requires a very careful examination and assessment about whether she's actually developing uh, normally or not. Um, and is sleeping poorly and it may be that the poor sleep is related also to some of the problems that there are in the family between her, uh, the, the, the mother and, and the father. Rashika, her situation is pretty tenuous. She, she's not financially independent. She's here with her husband. Um, she's on a spouse visa, so if things fall apart in the family, it's very unclear what her situation would be. 
Um, there, there are clear indications that uh, violence uh, is happening. Uh, she's got bruises. She tries to cover them up during the initial consultation with the GP. Um, she is very concerned but is not talking uh, about this, nor is her husband. There are some indications that she may be depressed. So at some point, I think it's going to be necessary for an assessment uh, of her mental state, work out, is she, de is she, is she depressed? Uh, what is the severity of her depression? Is this related to her her baby's difficulties? We know that depressed the children, the very young children of depressed mothers, run into all kinds of problems. So this may be happening with her child. And there's a there's quite a worrying comment uh, towards the end where there's some discussion about the baby and whether the baby should be sent back to be looked after by her parents in India. Uh, Rashika's comment is, she's all I have. Um, this suggests that she's not in a very good state. Um, you know, there, there is clearly a need to carry out a, a, a very good uh, assessment about um, her, her mental state, whether she's got a significant depression or, or other problems. The problem, of course, is that her husband Ishan is very reluctant for her to do anything on her own. He is not very keen for her to see the doctor by herself, she's not very. He's not keen for her to go to the to the temple on her own. He says he's worried that the the place where the temple is located is a bit dangerous, so he doesn't want her going on her own. Um, he really doesn't want his his uh, his wife Rashika to do anything very much on her own. He is clearly in control in this family, and uh, he's also under pressure, as Joanne has said. He seems to be running into some difficulties with his study, keeping up. Um, that's related both to the problems with the child and the child's sleeping and also the fact that he has to work. So I think what, what we have here is uh, um, essentially um, a family which is in trouble. Uh, the, the, the baby's got some difficulties that need to be carefully assessed. Certainly the mother has some difficulties. But as Johan, Joanne has correctly said, we need also to be a bit concerned about what's happening with, her, with the husband and what his situation is. And some of the problems is the, 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 the control that uh, the husband is exercising over his wife's ability to be, see anybody on her own. Um, I think it's a little early for Rishika to be the focus of this although there are some very clear indications that that family violence is likely to be happening. Um, and I think the other issue is whether Rishika's situation can actually be improved without engaging her husband, Ishan. And so it seems to me that what we have uh, is a number of risks to keep in mind. Certainly the risk of violence, um, worsening mental health problems in Rishika, possibility that uh, if things fall apart in the family that you may be able to uh, remain in Australia. For the husband, um, he, he is the likely perpetrator of the violence. Um, this by itself suggests that there is enormous stress within the family. There's a possibility that he might lose his wife and child if things uh, are not resolved. Um, and there's a possibility that he's not doing it all well in his studies. And I think we need to keep in mind some of the cultural issues here. An international student, it's costing somebody a lot of money to keep him here and study. There are issues of his own pride and the family's pride if he's not doing well in his studies. So those things may also be contributing significantly to his behavior um, in relation to his wife and also to his child. Although there's no suggestion of it, I think the possibility that the child, the baby might be at risk needs always to be kept in mind. And so that's something that needs to be, to be, to be considered. And there's the, the risk that the family might break up if things don't, don't, uh, are not resolved. But as I mentioned before, I think it's unlikely that it's going to be possible to do anything effective about these multiple risks without actually engaging Ishan. And as jo Joanne has said, I think the entry point is the baby. I think both the father and mother are clearly concerned about the baby. 
um, about its growth, about its poor sleep and so on. Um, I think concern um, about the baby is likely to, the, likely to be the most acceptable entry point to a broader assessment of how this family is functioning. There are obviously big problems in terms of family functioning and I think assessing that is the, 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 the most urgent issue. In terms of whether Rishika is referred by a general practitioner to some specialist support, it's very unlikely that her husband would accept and she herself may not accept referral to a psychiatrist at this, at this stage. Um, Johan, Joanne has already said that it's a bit down the track uh, in terms of actually being able to bring to the fore this issue of domestic violence and it may be at some point a little bit further down the track that somebody else can be brought in to look at the issue of violence. And one of the things that needs to be thought about, I think, is the possibility of referring to a paediatrician who, who is known to have very good skills in both assessment of families and also assessment of possible mental health problems in the different members of the family. And this may be the way to actually get into this family and to start looking at what's happening, um, start getting the family to acknowledge the problems that do exist and open up a space uh, to look for some kind of resolution of those problems, which may or may not involve specific psychiatric treatment. So that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry. That was, that was an excellent uh, presentation, and, and as, as was Joanne's. And now we move on to Lata's um, presentation, our, um, our psychologist. Shall I go ahead, Michael? Yeah? Yes, go ahead. Thank okay. you, Lata. Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, I would just like to um, provide this presentation in terms of what my usual experience is with regard to women approaching me. Yes, sometimes we would expect that the first port of call would be perhaps a GP or a psychiatrist. However, the way women usually approach me uh, is that they do so voluntarily. Uh, they somehow seem to just become aware of the service that I provide. I'll let you know that I do work as a voluntary psychologist uh, because, of course, I do work as a lecturer in the university, but that work is separate to the work that I do within the Indian community, um, especially within the Indian community, but I also assist migrants from other backgrounds who are going through abuse. So the women usually just... Uh, call me or uh, tell their friend to perhaps uh, check me out in terms of whether I would be able to assist them or not, and also to really um, become aware of whether I would be trustworthy enough. See, they would usually want to speak about their problems to somebody whom they can trust and somebody who does not know their family. So I might especially fit into that second category. You know, they become aware of the trust issues a little later. Um, and then they become aware that perhaps I have helped other women and that I may know the system. Uh, so they become aware of this either, again, through friends or through other people. You know, some people have also called, you know, just done a search through Google. Uh, they've asked their friends to do a Google search, and then their friend informed the friend over here who was in hospital to uh, call me and say that perhaps whether I could help them or not. Um, again, through Facebook, uh, it's just because I have formed a group called the Indian Women Support Group. And so they, if they try to Google anything, again, about pro uh, providing support to Indian women, um, they may come across that or through an organization. And I've written there unlikely because they usually, again, would not approach an organization to talk about any difficulties they may be having. So overall, the woman who might be going through intimate partner violence, such as Rashika herself, would initially contact me on a very informal basis. But however, of course, the advice that I provide would all be professional, and I do inform them of the confidentiality issues and all of the other regulations and that I would follow when they are narrating their um, stories, if you like, to me and their difficulties to me. So um, 
it um, it is difficult for them to make that first port of call. It's really difficult. And, uh, you know, a lot of the time the women have actually gone through several years of abuse, ranging from anywhere between one year to 14 years of abuse before they've actually picked up the phone and called somebody or even told anybody of the difficulties that they have been facing for most of their lives. So it is a very difficult issue for women to even just pick up the phone and call. So, uh, you know, uh, Joanne has gone through about the GP and how they would diagnose them. I think it's a really important uh, po- a point wherein a GP could actually try and pick up on certain signs as to what might be happening within the family. Because apart from approaching a psychologist, you know, they would more so um, approach a GP for any other instance, such as the child being unwell. So this is where GPs, I think, need to be trained further to pick up and look out for signs, really, uh, in relation to intimate partner violence, and then actually act on it. I do know of a few GPs who are uh, quite aware of these issues and they do pick up on uh, the signs and then do something about it. Unfortunately, some of the other people I speak to, they're aware that it may actually involve more paperwork and so they're not prepared to actually uh, do something about it unless the family actually tells them uh, something. So uh, that is something that we need to be aware of as well. And um, in, so if someone does contact us, you know, it's about how do we um, help them. And I think the first important thing is to understand the person. And I say understand her. It's big, what I mean is that understand her holistically in terms of how difficult it must have been for her to actually just pick up the phone or to even approach you to tell you anything at all in terms of the difficulties that she may be having, whether the person approaches you as a GP or as a a social worker or, you know, you come across her through another kind of training organization. But I think it's really important to understand when the woman starts speaking uh, about her background, to really be informed about her culture as well her cultural orientation and the cultural practices. And what I mean by this is that how difficult it would be for someone such as Rishika to open up anything at all about the husband and her experiences within the family because it is a matter of shame to actually um, talk badly about the family and, in fact, to talk about the difficulties one is experiencing within the household outside the household. So it's really important to be aware of that. We also need to understand the ostracization that may occur uh, for the family if Rishika went outside the family to actually seek assistance and talk about some of the negative experiences she's having uh, within her family. So we need to be really aware of that and that she may not want to seek formal assistance. See, a lot of the time, uh, we just, sometimes they just need someone to listen to them, to try and validate their responses that perhaps what is happening to them is a wrong thing. Uh, you know, they're not really aware a lot of the time that, uh, um, in fact, uh, there is a law against family violence. You know, a lot of uh, uh, countries around the world, they do not have laws uh, in relation to family violence or the laws are minimal, or again, you know, the men are protected to a great extent. So we need to be aware of these things as well and as to how, therefore, the women may not be aware of their rights and of the law in Australia. And uh, so they may not want to seek formal assistance. And so this is where we need to ask ourselves, how then can we encourage somebody like Rishika to seek assistance. So if they went to a person like Joanne, uh, you know, who picked up on certain signs, who was offering certain kinds of assistance and uh, recommending her to come back uh, for another checkup, uh, but then if she didn't want to come back alone or uh, if the husband said that he was not going to bring her alone, how then could we actually encourage her to seek assistance? I think what we would need to do is to provide her with uh, pieces of information, perhaps brochures, information about uh, helpful organizations, resources, contact numbers, and also uh, some uh, definitions, a description of family violence itself. I think that would be really useful for them to go back and read.
in in terms of as a psychologist how i uh, respond to something like this is i make an initial assessment of their mental health concerns i ask them a whole range of questions and try to gauge how they are performing in all aspects of their lives if they have children how they're looking after their children how in fact perhaps their children might be uh, suffering as well and they may not be so well their physical and um, psychological uh, health may be of concern so i do try and perform an initial assessment what i usually realize is that uh, there are a whole range of factors that impact on their mental health and it's uh, not so easy to just target uh, you know only to try and for example provide counseling and uh, say well this is what i'm going to do and you know to try and help build up their resilience it's not so much that there are many many factors and we need to try and understand those factors and uh, in fact what i have realized is that in fact we cannot uh, enhance their mental well-being unless those other matters are taken care of when i say other matters i mean something like basic necessities such as provision of food accommodation uh, being able to stay in the country i'm currently assisting a woman whose visa runs out on thursday and she needs to leave the the government has told her this is uh, an intervention that has been provided at the ministerial level and the minister of immigration has told that she needs to leave the country by thursday i've been coordinating for the past week a whole range of efforts to try and get her to stay in the country we have found a way and we are submitting the application tomorrow morning and i am hopeful that's all i can do at this stage all of us can do at this stage i am hopeful that she will be able to stay beyond thursday so there are many other factors that need to be taken care of usually prior to us only focusing on the mental well-being aspect and so this is what i try and do uh, to see how i can assist with those other matters as well and i usually have um, contacts with a range of people who are able to assist but uh, something like provision of food i just send out an email to all the people i know and ask them for donations if they can provide uh, groceries for example or money for petrol and so on and usually people have been very responsive these are just individuals within the community uh, they usually provide me uh, like you know just a few weeks ago i sent out um, uh, an email uh, on sunday afternoon by monday night i had groceries um, that would have uh, been enough for a month for the family so these are the kinds of matters i'm talking about so when there are urgent basic needs to be met we need to be uh, careful and we need to assess that and we need to see how we can respond to that and i think what needs to really happen here which will lead into my next uh, slide is that we need to work collaboratively everyone together not just the medical professionals but i'm saying people within the community people who are um, able to offer a whole range of other services everyone needs to really work collaboratively so that we can uh, understand the challenges we can meet those challenges and we can assist the people you know because there are real practical needs it's not enough for us to only speak about the theory yes we need evidence pre- uh, based practice for intervention to understand what family violence is but we also need to understand in terms of how uh, the community actually needs our help right now and i think as professionals even for me as uh, an academic for me what i see is that the translation of knowledge is very important yes we understand what family violence is and what interventions can do which effect uh, which interventions are effective but then we need to really translate that into our practice and i think it's important for everyone to do that um you know to try and do the best we can um and i think there are so many resources out there some of them are being underutilized in fact a lot of them people just don't know uh, where to go for help uh, for me just by trying to assist each woman and each person situation is so very different i've just become aware of the system so much more uh, but there's always so much more that i'm learning so i think everyone needs to really work collaboratively and i think in fact this is perhaps a great opportunity for us all to come together and understand uh, what uh, responses are available and how perhaps you know in fact if everyone could talk about the resources that they have available i think that would be great as well so i hope Dada. that we can all work together and really assist the people in need such as rishika and ashan and the family there thank you thank you very much lata my pleasure
Um, and thank you very much for making us think outside the square um, and outside the square of our particular disciplines, but also mentioning the collaboration between disciplines, which is so important in, in, in managing cases. And now we're just going to move on to Vivienne Braddock's um, uh, presentation. Vivienne? Yes, hello. Thank you, Michael. I'll just move um, your slide on. Thank you. There we go. Yeah. Um, I think certainly uh, the speakers that have gone before me have talked about a lot of um, things that I was going to cover and a lot of really important things. So some of the things I might cover fairly briefly because we've already Vivienne, gone through them. Vivienne, sorry. Vivienne, sorry. The sound is just dropping out a bit. Um, if you can just move it closer to the skin on your on your on your cheek, it'll it'll sound better. Thank you. Okay. Is that any better, Michael? Yeah, that's much better. Thanks. Fantastic. My apologies for that. So look, this client or this type of client, we would see Rashika. She would have been referred to our service probably through a number of different sources, possibly a GP, possibly a friend of hers may have encouraged her to seek some help. And I guess our starting point would be looking at doing a really good assessment, considering what are the mental health concerns and presentations and certainly thinking about not just Rashika but the whole broader family, that there are a number of issues for each of the members in this family. Rashika, while she is the person who we see initially and hear about initially and, and certainly raises questions for me about uh, is there depression or something else going on, really needs to be looked at, but so do the others in the family. Um, certainly the baby, we need to think about whether or not there are issues around sleep, whether or not the failure to thrive has some medical causes and concerns. And certainly if you have a baby who's not sleeping, then it's going to be incredibly difficult to get sleep yourself and you're going to feel really lousy. So those are some of the things that we need to think about, both from a medical point of view and a mental health point of view. I think it's very important when we're thinking about this family and this couple um, is looking at some of the personal history as well. We know they've just come to Australia. We know that there's an arranged marriage, but we don't know what their goals and their hopes and their dreams are. We get a bit of a sense for Rashika that she had a career before she had a baby. And while she loves this baby, obviously that whole process of having a baby, um, giving up a career can be really difficult. And we certainly have heard um, about Ishan and the fact that he's obviously experiencing lots of pressures around trying to raise a young family, thinking about his study and trying to do well there, and also a lot of the financial pressures. I think there's some real indication that there may be some significant financial pressures. Not only are they here in Australia, they're trying to support themselves while one person studies, um, they're raising a new baby. What we don't know at the moment is what sort of debts does this family have um, both to come to Australia and to be able to study in Australia. As international students, that whole process is exceptionally expensive. Um, sorry, I'll just get myself together here and move across to the next slide. I want to talk a little bit about some of the cultural considerations for this family. And when I'm looking at it and assessing with this family, some of the things that I really want to look at is what are their expectations of themselves? So we know that probably Ishan is very committed and dedicated to studying and doing really well there and probably has that expectation of himself. I suspect we've also got two parents that are incredibly dedicated to their little baby um, and want to be good parents. I suspect also something else that we need to think about in relation to their expectations of themselves are, are they being good children? That they probably have um, extended family that they have responsibilities for and what are those responsibilities and how are they impacting on this family at the moment as well? In looking at some of those things, we also need to think about the broader extended family. We know the family are in India. We know they're unable to come out here and help this family, but they are looking for solutions as well. And one of their solutions is the idea of maybe the baby comes home to India, we look after the baby, you focus on your studies and your work, um, which can sound on the surface of it a, a really kind of distressing idea, but not necessarily. This may be something that is going to fit for them and work for them, and we need to keep that in mind. So we need to think about so some of those expectations on, from and on the extended family. We also need to think about particularly what is their explanation about what's happening. If we say that we think Rashika has a depression, what is it, her understanding and her explanation about what is happening for her? Um, she may have a very different explanation about what are the causes of how she's feeling. 
um, and we need to keep those in mind. We also need to think about and talk with her about if we think she has a depression, what is the stigma associated with that for her? She may not want to come and see a mental health service. It may be too shameful. It may be too embarrassing. She may not want to seek out assistance around the violence because it may be too shameful and difficult. And in talking with them about her explanation of what's happening for her. We need to build an understanding about what are her expectations and what is her understanding about how you raise children. Um, is it the role of just her as a mum or is it that she would expect traditionally that she would have her extended family supporting her? And one of her struggles at the moment is that they're not here to do it and she's doing it alone. So what is her ex um, explanation of how she can cope at the moment as well is really important. I think that we've talked a lot about the domestic violence tonight and it's very important and we need to understand what is her explanation of that. And finally, we need to think about language barriers. Is language a barrier for this family? And particularly when we're doing things like counselling, mental health assessments, even if people have a good level of English, it may not be enough English to be able to really participate in counselling or to have a really good assessment. So while they may have enough conversational English, I might use an interpreter to be able to assist with that process. Moving right along. Okay, just thinking about some of the social considerations. This family's immigration status is something that we need to think about. We know that they're here as students. I don't know a lot about the provisions of the student visas, but I suspect and I would need to look into what are their rights to access service. This family may be Medicare ineligible, which makes them ineligible to a whole bunch of services yes. and suddenly makes the cost of seeing a GP, getting medication, seeing support services prohibitively expensive. So for this family, if we said, Rashikan is an antidepressant, that may be too expensive if we're looking at putting her on a course of antidepressants for six months. We need to think about those things really carefully. Also in relation to this family, we need to think about what are the child protection obligations. We know that Anisha is small, we know she's not sleeping particularly well, we need to get to the bottom of that and what is going on um, and see whether or not there are concerns for this baby. We also need to think about the domestic violence as well. What sort of supports does this woman need? In relation to her immigration status, again, we'd probably have to think about whether or not there are domestic violence provisions for her in her visa. So for some people who have visas, um, temporary visas here in Australia, they may be able to access domestic violence provisions in that that allow them to leave a partner but actually be able to stay in Australia. Whether that exists for somebody on a student visa, I'm not sure and we'd have to check into it. Then we need to look me, at those I'm sorry, for, 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 run, for one reason or another, we're running way over time at the moment. So may I ask you just to have a look through your last two slides and, and just speak for about a minute just to the most important uh, summing up that you wish to make, and then we can go straight into the questions uh, that we need to ask of each other in the panel in relation to collaboration. Absolutely. So yes, so looking at those formal, informal supports, um, I think Leita has done a really lovely job about talking about how she does that informally, particularly for people who are unable to access services because of their visa status, that's going to be really critically important. So the things that I'd be thinking about for ongoing care, we need to think about health care for the baby, for the mum, we need to think about a, a mother and baby clinic, we need to think about a paediatric review. Mental health care, again, issues around um, access to Medicare are going to be really important. If there is an access to Medicare, our standard options are really going to have to be scrutinised a lot more closely um, and looking at pro bono options or cheaper options that people can access. Informal supports are going to be really important and also to, I think, looking at some legal options and legal advice. So here in Queensland we have a community organisation called Rails that would probably be able to assist really nicely for this woman and her child. But I'll leave it there, Michael. Oh, look, at that, that has just been a, a great overall uh, social uh, work um, aspect uh, to this case and it, it, it actually um, mirrors what much of what Lata was saying, um, and, and I, well, I'm so grateful for it. Lata, uh, you had a question for Harry in relation to therapy uh, for, for Ashika. Could I ask you to quickly ask that question? 
you wanted me to ask the question. Um, you had a question that you were going to ask, Harry, oh, or yes, if you Harry, like, yes, we, 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 we discussed yes, this correct. earlier. I can yes, ask Harry would, for you if you like. Oh, no, that's fine. I'm happy to ask Harry. Um, Harry, yes, I would like to ask you, please, um, in terms of which therapy would you prescribe uh, to the client? Uh, what I have noticed in most situations um, when the women are referred by a GP to a psychiatrist, uh, they're usually prescribed antidepressant medication. Um, and uh, this uh, may not really address a whole range of issues. Yes, uh, they may be experiencing depression, and that might be one aspect. However, I was just wondering if there are other alternative forms of therapy that you might suggest to the women. There are lots of there are lots of alternatives, Lata. Um, uh, like like with everything else, if the if the main contributor to the depression is the problems in the family or family violence or other such factors, then they need to be dealt with. I think the question of whether um, medication, antidepressant or other sorts of medication, is a clinical judgment that's made, but it's certainly not the first thing that should come to mind. And for this particular person that we're discussing, it's way too early to be thinking about any kind of specific treatment. There's a lot of work to do before getting to the point of making a decision about whether specific psychiatric treatment is necessary and then what kind of treatment is mo most appropriate. Thanks very much, Harry. Vivienne, I noticed that you had a question as well that you might throw open to the whole panel um, in relation to working with this mum um, in that antidepressants or, or psychotherapy may not be what you want. Could you could you pose that question? Yes, absolutely. So my question is, if in working with this family and working with mum, we find that um, we think she has a depression um, and we talk with her about that and talk about options for therapies for depression. And in explaining to that, what would we do if she said, look, I don't think my problem is a mental illness. I actually think my problem that I'm experiencing is because I'm being punished for something I've done in the past, some sort of sin. How do we start working with her when her explanatory model is actually very different from our own? Joanne, could I put that question yeah. to you, please? That is such a great question. I've had that question, and I think it's really interesting. I think the first thing is to really explore her explanatory model and really get some detail about how she sees it and how she thinks it's affecting her, and then go from there into... How is this managed in your community? If someone, if if it, there was someone else in a similar situation, how serious would the problem be? How would you deal with it? Um, what needs to be done? And occasionally, people have found great relief when these sorts of problems actually have been dealt with. Um, in a cultural context, in the Australian community, people have had profound mental health relief. So we must take it very, very seriously. So could I ask the panel then, would there be a role for collaboration between the different disciplines to have this more open approach rather than looking at each discipline as being the source of specific expertise? If I might comment, Michael, I th there's absolutely a role for collaboration. Uh, the, the problems in, in this particular family are social problems. They're, 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 uh, there may be medical problems. There may be significant psychological, psychiatric problems. And I think it's likely, uh, like with everything else, if we can identify what are the factors that are contributing to distress, dysfunction, illness, then those things need to be dealt with. And in this case, they're mostly social. They're mostly social issues. So if they've got really serious financial problems, that's going to need to be dealt with somehow. If they've got relationship problems, then family functioning, so the psychology of the family needs to be dealt with. If it turns out that, um, that the mother has a significant depression uh, for which psychological and social approaches are not going to be sufficient, then it may be that that some kind of a, a medical approach needs to be taken. But as I mentioned before, I think that's a long way down the track. 
And in the presentation in the case, there isn't really a lot to suggest that she has a very severe depression. So it's the psychological and social issues that need to be dealt with first as far as she is concerned, as well as the, the, the issues of ensuring her safety and the child's safety. Thanks very much, Harry. And then just returning to you later, I can give you two minutes to discuss therapy um, because you're, you're actually dealing with it on a, on a, on a daily basis. So in terms of therapy, uh, yes, we do need to understand uh, the person's background and they may have a whole range of spiritual beliefs and uh, we do need to respect those as well. However, we do need to inform them that apart from the spiritual beliefs uh, that we would like to validate their experiences, I think we need to inform them and educate them about what family violence is and that, in fact, it is not permissible by the law. So uh, we need to firstly try and, uh, uh, you know, I think they have some understanding that they are going through abuse, but they do not have a term for it. We need to inform them that there is a term for it, but also that there are laws in this country that would uh, enable them to be protected. And so we need to inform them some of the basics first uh, before actually, I think, going into the therapy. And uh, we need to understand, again, their family's perspective. You know, they may, again, not want to come in for long-term therapy. They may, um, uh, you know, just want to speak uh, on an occasional basis, perhaps until the next, um, uh, you know, let's say physical abuse occurs. So we need to also give them the option of um, coming back to us when they are comfortable to, but then informing them that there are these resources available should they need to access them. Thank you very much, Lata. Um, unfortunately, time is moving on, so I will be moving shortly on for a summation from each of our panelists. Um, you're allowed only two minutes uh, to summate, and uh, I will be quite um, stringent on that. Um, I make no apologies for letting the panelists speak um, longer than normal. Um, I think um, this, this webinar is all about collaboration, and, and each and every uh, presentation uh, touched on collaboration. So without further ado, I'm just going to go back in, in the order um, of presentation again uh, to Joanne. Would you like to just summate just for two minutes? just from yep. your point of view. Um, yep. Thanks, Michael. My, my summary would be, first of all, to try to engage the family as much as possible, both partners using all the resources of the practice at one's disposal. Uh, perhaps a male GP for Ishan, um, using physical health check to get him engaged for Rishika, just becoming a friend, becoming somebody that, a place that she can come to. And then, the other thing is very much the importance of kindness, that uh, when you approach people who are struggling like this with kindness and competence, um, a little seed can be planted and things may develop from there. That was lovely. I, I think that's extremely important. Thank you very much. Harry, would you like to sum up for, for two minutes, please? Thanks, Michael. Um, the, the situation that's described um, in this case is unfortunately very common. And I think anybody who deals with either in a primary care setting or in social support settings will know that, that this is uh, 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 an issue in the community which has been largely hidden. In some immigrant communities, it's more invisible than in others. And we've spoken a little bit about the fact that uh, the woman may be reluctant, she may not be able to talk about the possibility of violence. I think we need to keep in mind a, a set of priorities. We need to be very clear about assessing risk, and particularly risk to safety. If there is any concern, and I see a number of the comments from the participants in the webinar about why not go to the police. Uh, there, is, there are mandatory reporting rules for domestic violence. The situation, I think, is a little more complex in that, in that intervention which happens too early may, in fact, make the situation very much, work, very much worse, and it may be that the person is at even greater risk. 
So we need to keep in mind first the issue of safety and then move in a methodical way through to all of the other assessments that have been discussed. Thanks very much, Harry. Lata, um, I'd like you to sum up, but I'd like you probably to spend a little bit more time, probably four or five minutes um, to sum up. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Michael. Um, yes, I think what I would like to say is that when any of us um, listening to this or working in this area is intent on trying to assist uh, anybody who is going through family violence, I think we need to try and understand that it is such a complex issue, that there are a whole range of issues within all communities, you know, whether it be a migrant or a non-migrant community. And even within the migrant communities, each culture has its own intrinsic issues. And yes, it is difficult for us to become aware of the culturally intrinsic issues across all groups. However, I think as professionals, we have an obligation, we have a duty of care to try and understand their perspective. And so we need to try, uh, first of all, as much as possible to understand each one's own culture uh, when they do approach us, uh, to also be more open to other culture, uh, cultures and cultural groups, you know, interact with people people just on a general basis so that we can develop our understanding of other cultures. I think that's really important. And then when you are trying to assist someone because of the complexity of the issues, I think we need to try and be committed in the long haul for this. It is not an easy task to try and um, reduce family violence. Um, it can be an ongoing issue. Sometimes uh, it can stop. Uh, there are re a whole range of reasons why it can stop. Uh, for example, uh, just last week, uh, a woman's husband left uh, the country. So she feels safe now. And until then, she had nightmares almost every day. And she would wake up in the morning calling me uh, with really terrible nightmares. And her 14-year-old daughter, for example, again, uh, would have severe headaches again, because they had this realistic fear that the husband was going to kill them all. And so this is where when somebody tells us that they are um, having this fear, that they do fear that their husband or their partner is going to kill them, I think we need to acknowledge that. You know, we may not have all of the proof that uh, whether the husband or the other partner is going to kill them or not. However, we do need to acknowledge that, I think. And I think sometimes just acknowledging that would also help to develop the sense of trust. I mentioned very early on that uh, I think that uh, they need to develop a sense of trust in us for them to actually be able to narrate uh, their experiences uh, for me, as time goes, I become aware of so many more complex issues that have occurred in their lives. Uh, again, I think just because they do believe that I'm not going to go and do something wrong with that information. So I think the uh, development of trust is a really crucial issue because that's when you will learn about their experiences. And then as practitioners, like I said, because of the complexity of the issues, I think we need to be working collaboratively with the whole range of resources and organizations that we are aware of. And if we're not aware of it, to really become aware of them. Um, I'm trying to do that on a daily basis. I don't know myself all of the organizations. Uh, like, for example, I mentioned to you about this lady who needs to leave on Thursday. It was only yesterday that I became aware of a whole new visa category that uh, would be applicable in her situation. So we need to be aware of the system. And if one is not able to be fully aware of the system, which is a really difficult thing to do, to try and network, uh, to talk to others. You know, there are a whole range of people here from a whole range of organizations across Australia. And I think we all need to be connected better somehow. We need to ask people if we don't know, uh, you know, to just pick up the phone. And for me, what I always find is that even if people are not able to help, they usually provide me with another contact phone number. So I think we do need to become aware of resources uh, and to be aware that many migrant people, they may be here as temporary residents and may not be eligible for a whole range of services. You know, people may wonder as to why they cannot just go to a GP. Well, going to a GP means uh, the cost. Uh, the, a cost to them and they just cannot afford it and you may then wonder that uh, well if they're on a student visa in fact they do need to have um, 
medical insurance. Yes, they do need to have medical insurance, but if they're on a bridging visa, they're not required to have it, or in fact, a lot of people just cannot afford it, and they do stay on without medical insurance. So the reality is that people may just not have enough money to put food on the table for themselves or for their children or to even visit a GP. So how then are they going to pay a counselor, a psychologist, you know? And this is where I think more people need to try and put their hands up to try and do voluntary work as well. For me, I find that this is a challenge because, again, when I'm attending to critical situations, sometimes I'm running around doing a lot of the work on my own because um, it is a big commitment, as I mentioned. For example, sometimes I might just get a call saying, well, the person's visa was refused and the person has attempted suicide. I'm sorry to go into so much depth, but then no, this no, is what I face. No, no, please No, I can understand. And uh -huh, we so value your, your experience and expertise. Thank you, Michael. So I'm sorry if it's too much uh, uh, for no, anyone no, over here. Yeah. It's, it's just okay, a time. So if I can <laughs> just... Uh, yeah provide you again with a glimpse of that so again I could just get a call saying the woman over here has no one over here in this country that she knows of and that uh, you know for a whole range of very complex reasons uh, she was refused to stay in this country and then she attempted suicide in fact uh, uh, one of the women I had spoken to in the morning and I had tried to reassure her that we would find a way for her to remain in this country because it would have been shameful for her to return to the country the family had uh, disowned her back in India and uh, she just thought that well nobody could really do anything and I got a call on Friday evening when I just came back from work that uh, the ambulance was about to pick her up and take her to the Alfred so I stayed well, I all night at the as, Alfred Hospital As Michelle Whiting um, one of our um, participants has so well said it's the reality Lata and thank you for sharing so openly with us yeah, Now we'll just move um, on to Vivian and okay. for her summing up. Thank you, Lata. My pleasure. Yeah. I think the work that Lata does is absolutely amazing and inspirational. Um, thank you for sharing that. I think my summing up points are the things that I've learned tonight is it's so important to think broadly and holistically, to think about the social and the cultural implications, but also to think about not just the one person, but the whole family that we're working with. And we have to balance that up, absolutely. I've been reading a lot about everybody can see the complexity in this case, but how do we balance up that complexity, keep that in mind, think about safety, and also thinking about keeping engaged and working with this family. But some of the risks are really significant, and how do we ensure safety? And I think the solution is about some of that creativity that Lata mentions and talks about. We do have to get very creative with a lot of our clients, particularly people here on student visas, but also to people on bridging visas is really important. Thank you very much, Vivian. Um, and thank you very much, panel. You're a very talented panel, very knowledgeable. Um, I do hope you didn't think that I was being uh, too oppressive in your, in your timings. Um, we very much appreciate um, everything that you've done for us tonight. Uh, I'm just going to sum up now from, from my point of view, um, just my impression of, of this evening. It seemed to me as if physical health was an entree uh, to getting help for this family. It would have been culturally appropriate for them to seek physical health both for the baby and for the mother and for the father. The importance of engagement of all members, uh, that the presenting person is often not the person who needs the most help, uh, although in this case uh, she probably is. Uh, the effect of good rapport, um, the, the, the huge amount of fear that must be present within the family, uh, the culture shock that they're experiencing, uh, the importance of a holistic attitude, and the, as, as Lara so wisely said, the translation of knowledge, the translation of our knowledge across all disciplines to help this family. The importance of commitment um, and understanding the, com the complexity of the problem um, is extremely imp important. And also an acknowledgement um, of the family as a family unit and each individual member of the family. And also acknowledging that we don't have all the answers and that we sometimes need to look further into their expectations of care and into the uh, availability of assets in, within their own community. Um, I, I, I do wish that we could spend another um, half an hour to an hour um, speaking um, 
on this topic, but unfortunately, we don't have time. Um, the the webinar will be available um, to view again online, um, and please don't hesitate to uh, to view it if you've missed some parts of it. Uh, for the participants, I thank you for your patience uh, with the few technical uh, problems that we had earlier, and thank you for your questions and your participation. It was very much appreciated by the panel. Please ensure that you complete the exit survey before you log out. It will appear on your screen after the session closes, and certificates will be issued in four to five weeks. Um, the next webinar is Mental Health, Parenting, Recovery, and Interdisciplinary Panel Discussion, and that will be held on Thursday, the 26th of June. We at MHPN are very grateful for the support of, of BIMA, MHIMA, in producing this webinar. MIMA, for those who may not know, is a Department of Health uh, federal government initiative, and you can find out more about MIMA by going to their uh, website. And the link is is there. Um, I ju would just like to thank again the panel for the great contribution that, that they've given us. Um, I feel that the participants gained a great deal from Lata's hands-on experience, but I also feel that each participant, each panel member, contributed greatly and humbly from their own knowledge base. Um, I'd like to thank you all once again. I'd like to thank you, Joanne, Harry, Lata, and Vivienne, and uh, particularly for, those, for, that, for the amount of knowledge that you bring to this area uh, in which many of us flounder. On behalf of MHPN, I'd like to thank everybody for attending tonight. Thank you. <laughs>